Anyway, yeah, we're just about a minute away from starting. I want to make sure everybody's comfortable and uh, we'll kick it off here in about one minute. What are we talking about? <laughs> Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, Successful Strategies for Shaping Your Future. And today we're going to be talking, uh, focusing on, if you will, sort of the revival type, kind of we've been through the resetting and the survival piece. And now we're all thankfully moving a little bit closer to having an opportunity to reopen our facilities and our clubs. Uh, the session today, as usual, is brought to you by Club Solutions and Rex Executive Roundtables, and it's sponsored by the ABS Company. Back are two of my good friends and uh, colleagues, Blair Mahaney, CEO uh, of MXM and owner of the works of Wenatchee, Bill McBride, who's co-founder, president, and CEO of Active Wellness Company. And we've got two new guests this week, uh, Vicki Brick, who's the CEO of Brick Bodies, and Ed Fogarty, who's the founder and CEO of Club 24 Concept Gems. So welcome panelists, thank you for volunteering your time, especially during this uh, crazy period we're going through. Uh, before we begin, if we could just quickly let you give a brief introduction of uh, sort of your business model so that people can uh, relate to some of the concepts and ideas you might be sharing. So Blair, I'll let you and Bill go first and then uh, we'll let Vicki finish and then Ed can close us out. Um, works at Wenatchee Valley. There's uh, two clubs in Wenatchee, Washington, right in the right in central Washington. Um, huge, 22,500 square feet and about 17,000 square feet, about 5,000 members between those two clubs. And uh, group fit, the usual suspects: group fitness, personal training, snack bar, kids club. Thank you, Bill. Bill McBride, uh, Active Wellness. We manage fitness centers um, throughout the country. We're in 12 states, two in Canada. We manage hospital fitness centers, centers, commercial fitness centers, traditional commercial clubs, corporate sites. Um, you know, so anything in that multi-purpose uh, space. We have about 1,100 employees, most of which are not working currently um, in our organization. Um, so. Uh, Excited to be here, Brent. Uh, excited for this next phase of, uh, of, of this series with regard to reviving and recreating. Okay, Vicki. I'm Vicki Brick, CEO of Brick Bodies. We have four clubs in the Baltimore area, uh, three co-ed, one women's only, full service clubs, group X, personal training, aquatic centers, um, and our sizes range from uh, square footage from about 18,000 square feet to 60,000 square feet. Um, price range from about forty to sixty dollars a month, and we have around eighteen thousand members. Okay, go ahead, Ed. I have uh, seven locations throughout Connecticut. Um, smaller footprint clubs, about fifteen thousand square feet. Um, we have a lower price point, higher volume, so we range between ten and twenty a month. Um, similar to Blair, we do have a lot of the uh, usual suspects: Group X, Hydro Massage. Uh, PT, small group PT, that type of thing. Great. Well, yeah, this is a good, uh, maybe the ver most diverse uh, as far as concept offering panels we've had so far. So thank you all for joining us today. It'd be great to get some feedback from some different perspectives. So I want to kick it off first with something we've spent a little bit of time talking on the previous webinars. So I just want to touch on it briefly, but are there anything uh, have you done or discovered anything around the financial management piece over the last week or two that you think people would like to hear? Blair, you want to start with us? Well, you know, I, here, here's what I'd say. If you really, if you're having to work a lot on the financial management at this stage, you might be a little, you know, acting a, a little bit late. Hopefully right. uh, you were in early and if you did not get approved in the first round of the PPPL that you're sitting there in queue ready to go uh, for, for this round. But other than that, you know, we have uh, skeleton crews working. We're just trying to manage expenses down. We've had great participation from landlords, lease companies, banks, and we feel like we're in a, a really nice, strong position right now, even if this gets extended another uh, month here. Okay. And Bill? Yeah, my challenge is the uncertainty of reopening gates. Um, you know, 
every time I forecast or manage cash, <laughs> manage a budget, I knew the timelines I was playing with. Yeah. Um, and I have no timeline. You know, I'm hoping, hoping May 1, hoping June 1, hoping May 15th. You know, is it going to be July 1? So my problem is how far do you go into crisis mode versus fiscal responsibility conservative mode without knowing that open day when you have a fixed amount of money in the bank and, and so on. So, so, you know, or even I'm, what open I'm means. I'm personally struggling with um, the uncertainty of timing and, and the reactions based on that timing. Um, Blair, go ahead. I was going to say, in, in even what open means at that point, right? I mean, it's, it's just, it's not binary. Like we still don't know what open means, right? That makes it really hard to plan past that point. Yeah, I mean, it's not a simple math problem. Yep. Yeah, so to that end, Bill, uh, you're being challenged, but I know you've got, you're bright and you've got some really fantastic team members with you. How is it that y'all are planning it out? Are you running different sort of models based on opening or are you just sort of uh, have one model and you're flexible and modifying it as you go? What's the what's the game plan? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a management company um, and so we're working with different models at different sites in different states by different circumstances so um you know a site in new york city is working a little bit differently but not too differently than a site in ohio and so right. so we're dealing with individual sites um but um but you know it's you're looking at ar you're looking at ap you know or can people pay you based on their reality going on now and if they can then you may be in a different situation than if they can so, you know, managing AR, managing accounts receivable, managing accounts payable, managing all of those moving pieces with uncertainty of your own revenue streams and, and when they might come on, if they come back. Um, so each one's an individual case study. Yeah. So Vicki, I know uh, you've had the opportunity to continue paying your employees. They're still on the payroll and you're working with uh, this uncertain opening date as well. How, how have you dealt with that within your organization? Thanks, Brent. Yeah, we kind of use June 1st as a as a target open date, and if it happens beforehand, you know that's that's a bonus. Um, we've been fortunate that we applied for the PPP, we received the money um, in the past week, so now we're in the phase of how to maximize the spend, and then also looking at the second phase of uh, or the other second criteria of um, getting on FTEs back on the team in the designated. Um, time frame that the, that the government recommended. So we're in that phase um, and we've been, for, we feel very fortunate we've been able to accomplish a lot with our, our team and staff and our everyone's stepping up and doing an amazing job as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, Ed, do you have anything to add on the sort of the financial piece? Yeah, I think one thing that I've been doing that I think is important is just, uh, you know, keeping your eyes open for everything, even the smaller things like earlier in the week, I think it was on Monday, the Chamber of Commerce had a, uh, a 5,000 grant $5,000 grant program that they put out where, you know, if you're on the, if you're on the list, you got the email and you had to register right away and it, it closed down quickly. But, you know, things like that, that I think, you know, we're all focused on the big things, the PPP, that type of thing, but there's, you know, every organization out there has, whether it be grants or different programs. And even on a chat yesterday, somebody reminded me that um, part of the CARES Act, if you have existing SBA loans, there are situations where the SBA will pay six months of right. a loan that you've had for you know x number of years so it's i think the ppp is getting a lot of press right now the disaster loans but there's other there's other factors so just you know getting on the the ink magazine email list or the chamber of commerce email list or you know obviously the sba list but just staying open to everything and not just be totally focused on either the ppp or the disaster loan or you know whatever it is there's there's other resources out there hey, let me add to that check your local state government um, websites because a lot of the state governments have different aid packages yeah. as well. Right. Okay. So let's move away from the financial pieces. Blair mentioned that's a, hopefully a little bit in most people's rearview mirror, although we're still obviously dealing with it, but we should have a plan in place right now. What are you doing to sort of reset your club or have you already done or you're in the midst of doing while you've got this down period where you've got the opportunity to do some things that otherwise you may not have gotten to so what are some of the creative things you've done again during this time uh, ed why don't you start this one off go ahead 
Sure. So it's it's um you know for us I'm kind of looking at this as just a time for where you know the world has stopped. So there's within our business there's been so many things that you wanted to do, but it feels like when you try to take on a, a big project while you're running the club, it's it's you know trying to tune the engine while you're driving down the road. So you know we're taking this chance to we kind of broke out some of our teams and just really looked at you know where are the pain points when running the club, so that um, when we reopen things will be that much more streamlined and, and just a lot a lot easier to work with. So one of the areas that we spent a lot of time with is just our new employee onboarding, which was in the past, it was a lot of paperwork, a lot of manuals, a lot of you know written tests, things like that. So we're transitioning a lot of that to a more digital platform. So it's, it's a lot more video based, um, a lot more online learning so that when we reopen, all the time that used to take to, to bring a new employee on is now going to just be that much easier for our existing staff so that um, really every everywhere there was a either a, a choke point or a pain point in our clubs we're, we're trying to take the time now to just go back and analyze and say how can we make this smoother so that when we reopen we're essentially a different company and it, it's just going to be hopefully a lot easier to either bring new people on or get our existing team up to speed on a new program because a lot of this learning they'll be able to do on on their own uh, whether it be video chat or just uh, pre-recorded videos or just online documents. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great, I think that's a great use of your time, uh, Ed. And a part of that, when you bring the employees back, are you gonna do any sort of retraining or reorientation with your employees when you when you do yeah, the job? So, uh, we, we were in a, in a uh, fortunate position where we've kept all of our full-time staff on through this process. So um, it's, it was really our part-timers that um we'll be bringing back and you know we have a plan in place but you know kind of like bill was saying it's hard to set that plan too tight because we don't know when the comeback date is so um but you know whether it's two weeks out four weeks out we already have kind of a a plan in place for what kind of retraining we want to do um, new programs that we're going to be offering to get everybody up to speed so we'll start bringing them back in in groups and just start really working through that process. But even in the meantime, just with our existing staff that's still on, we're doing weekly training just to, to try to stay sharp, whether it be sales training or customer service training, that type of thing. Yeah, and Blair, I know you have a have a sort of a game plan or a thought about one of the things we're gonna need to train all our employees on is the new cleaning protocols, right? Can you speak to that? Yeah, so a couple things, and and I, I couldn't agree more with what Ed, and I, I like, so, you know, Ed immediately went into processes, right? And and a lot of times we overlook that. We, we're doing a lot of physical plant improvements, and it is so critical to look at all your processes. And I would say ev evaluate all your processes to determine if they're happening to the customer or for the customer. And in Ed's case, what he's saying is the employee is the customer there. So let's make sure this happens for them. I think that I think that's critical. There will be new sanitizing and cleaning processes that we all have. I think it's important that every employee uh, is trained on those. And I, I'll keep saying this: how your employees hold members accountable to the new member standards is going to be critical. And uh, we've known for a long time that two of the biggest drivers behind customer loyalty are staff friendliness, club cleanliness. So while a lot of those housekeeping duties are going to be pushed out to the periphery, in other words, the members are going to now have a lot of housekeeping duties, so to speak. As that happens, it's going to be important that your employees are engaged with the members when they see bad behavior. Because what's almost worse than the employee watching, and so I'll just tell you, we have over 51,000 pieces of feedback now, and, and so we can see so much information on this shutdown survey. And, and when people describe the bad behavior of another member not cleaning equipment, they, they don't like that. But equally bad behavior is that one of your employees watched it, and they didn't do anything about it. So what we're, we're, we're calling it compliance ambassador training. And it includes role playing. It includes some video stuff, and every single employee will go through it, from the GM to front desk to kids club, so that when we have the kind of new laws in place, we have a a, a friendly way to approach this, so that we can have people in compliance, but we don't suffer um, 
that that staff friendliness that we know is is so critical and such a part of you know who we are. So, uh, yeah. One of the one of the questions from the attendees for Blair or Ed about that are using any. Can you recommend any platform that you're doing this employee training on digitally? Go ahead, Ed. So right now we're using obviously Google Drive just to store everything, but one of the platforms we're looking into that uh, one of our people found is called Illumi. Um, so we're researching that, getting pricing information. So that'll be more of an online platform, but currently we're building and, and storing within Google Drive. And can you spell that for everybody, Ed? Yes, it's E-L-O-O-M-I. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, what about what about the bricks, uh, Vicky? What are what are you doing in your clubs to, to kind of reset and uh, take advantage of this opportunity? Yeah. So similar to Blair and Ed, we're focusing a lot on our team leadership development, and we believe culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we really wanted to refine um, uh, and give our team uh, the ability to educate themselves and empower our leaders to work with their team. So for example, tomorrow we're doing a um, sensitivity training with our team. So that way to prepare them for situations that they might encounter when we reopen, um, sensitivity not only with each other as employees, but sensitivity with the members. Similar to what Blair mentioned is we're um, doing role playing different scenarios and we're also gonna um, have our teams see, get inside the club and experience it's the member journey, so they're experiencing things through the members' eyes that we always talk about. So the team's not only coming up with what is what is what does our reopening plan look like, but then they're living it and experiencing it as if a member would, and then they'll be able to come back and make new suggestions and um, improvements. Our team's also been really hard at work the first couple of weeks. We launched our Brick Bodies Virtual Studio, which is a um, additional fee base for our um, group exercise classes, on-demand library for group exercise and personal training. We're also doing virtual personal training through Zoom, our virtual team training classes through Zoom, and then we're continuing to offer free content through our social media channel. So I feel, feel fortunate. The team's been working really hard, and I think we have a good foundation to build upon for when we reopen, because as we all know, um, we're going to be under strict limitations, um, capacity guidelines, and the, this virtual world is only going to continue to grow with what we're offering. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. That, that's great stuff. Um, we're still getting a bunch of questions coming in, so I want to try and get a chance to answer a couple of those. One that came based on the comments about the cleaning is, is there any sort of a cleaning schedule per se that, that you think is going to be ideal? Uh, any of you can answer that. Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, um, go ahead. Thank you, go ahead. Intermission system where um, members have the ability to, to book reservations in the club for every 90 minutes and then almost have scheduled cleaning um, 30 minutes, like after every 90 minute block, have a scheduled 30 minute cleaning for the whole team to clean. We basically um, stop admission into the club for those 30 minutes and have that intermission where we shut down, do a deep clean structure cleaning and then reopen again for the next reservation block. So that's part of the scheduling that we're looking at as a team. Go ahead, okay. I wanna circle back on that cleaning, uh, Blair, but first I wanna give Bill a chance to answer sort of what he's done to reset across the different clubs and what they're looking at. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, Blair, when you were talking, the idea popped in my head of a public service announcement on all the digital displays showing courteous behavior with members wiping their equipment. That's, 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 great. What popped, that's what popped in my head when you were talking. Um, we haven't done that. I will say that there's some clubs that plan to enforce harshly member conduct on the cleaning and warn members and even suspend members. And there's some clubs that are just going to role model. Um, I would caution you to be careful because there'll be righteous members that will be very one end of the spectrum and there'll be other members on the other end of the spectrum. And you don't want members enforcing your policies because you will have conflict. And so examples, cultural examples, but try not to have your members feeling like they get to police your club because I've seen more times than not when, when members do that around cell phones, that kind of thing. It creates a lot of conflict. So really training your staff how to handle conflict resolution with members in addition to the role modeling. And I think what everybody shared was great. I don't have anything to add on that one, Brent. Okay. I think that I think that's such a good point, Bill, and all the more reason to build that into that training right now. Yeah. Because you do have you're are going to have those extremes, and you just don't want that conflict happening there. And I want to 
come over the top on something that Vicky was talking about, about um, journey mapping. And not everybody is probably taking it that sophisticated of approach, but they should. I, because oftentimes people think about customer journey map and they do it sort of conceptually. And it is and it is a good practice to do that on the whiteboard and think of all the touch points and whiteboard that out. But go in the frickin' gym and actually do it yourself. And when you do it, think of some of your key personas and look at that map through their eyes. You know, be the 35-year-old female coming in for the first time with the kids. But from the parking lot, walk through, go up to group fitness. I've said this before, the other journey map that you should do, and, and if you have a member who is an infectious disease expert, get that physician to do a journey map with you. It's extremely powerful. I promise you they'll see details that you don't see. And sometimes it'll be, you don't, they wouldn't even have to come. Sometimes it's they're a member that you just say, can you help us with, you know, when we're adopting new products, new processes, new technologies, will you look at this for me? Because you know, all that stuff comes with peer reviewed journal articles that, you know, give me brain damage. So I have an infectious disease expert. I can kind of give those to, he reads them, gives me his feedback. And, and then I asked him to help me with journey mapping. And even without coming into the gym yet, he said, here's four things I can tell you right now that you probably missed. I mean, it's just a great, it's a great resource. So I think Blair, what would help the audience is let's hear the four things because they're not going to go do that. So what did you learn that they can learn from quickly? Well I'll, well, I'll give you one. For for 40 years, we've had these trays at our front desk that everybody puts their keys in. Well, when we did our walkthrough journey map, we didn't think to do it with keys in our hand and see what right. the member, right? Well, we can't do that. We have um, on the deck, we're thinking that we have, you know, some Cybex ARC trainers that are that have good clearance and everything, except they overlook an area where people are breathing hard. You know, it could it could fall down into that and fall down into that space. I'll have to think what the other two are. I have, a, I have a list of 15 things that we've already changed in our processes, but those were. Well, for few. me yesterday, one was scales that aren't digital, ah. blow dryers and water fountains. Every time my team and I meet, we've come up with new touch points, you know. Yeah. Oh, the other one that he came up with, and, and now I think it's out there a lot, so probably a lot of people are doing it. He, he said, you have to have sanding wipes in your locker room so people can wipe down locker handles and, and, and oh, bench. I said cool. that last week, Blair. Oh, I know, but he told me that, you know, two weeks ago, Bill. Oh. I think he stole it from me. Okay. <laughs> Another question from the audience. I'll let... Uh, uh, any of you answer this is what kind of cleaning products or systems have you found that kills COVID-19 that you might recommend? Can I? Uh, no. Go Blair. I know you've got some. I, I don't know that anybody's actually been able to test anything against COVID-19. So right. there are there are proxy viruses that are being used that they say if it does this, you know, it's wrapped in a protein and a fat. And if it can like, you know, uh, ozone definitely is very effective on these others, so it's probably a good proxy for COVID-19. The, the, the biggies that we found is something called MyShield. It has a patented product called Zetrasol that actually uses micro voltage to kill, and once it's on something, it can kill virus for about three weeks. We're incorporating that into everything that we're doing using electrostatic spray guns and that. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Okay, let's move on to uh, sort of the second. Yeah, I gotta, I'll add another one. What the hell? I'll add another one. Okay. Uh, nanoseptic. Go to nano, nanoseptic.com if you haven't done that. And look yeah. at their it, it basically stickers that go on handles. They're very reasonable. They use light to kill virus. So there's a couple of good resources. And from a perception standpoint, those look good, right? They make yep. people have confidence that cleaning is happening. Yeah. And you can also get them with your logos on. You can order an update. That's cool. Uh, so the questions are primarily that are coming in from the audience are really more around what you're doing related to opening. So let's move forward to that. Uh, what are you looking forward toward opening? Are you changing any sort of membership pricing, offering new programs? How are you going to manage the potential limitations on flow of traffic? What platforms are you using to communicate and reserve those spots? Um, Ed, I know we talked before we started that you were kind of really exploring that pretty deeply. What have you found and what are you planning? 
So again, it, it, it comes back down to, you know, when we open and what, what the phases will look like. But one, you know, one of the things we're definitely exploring is, you know, we have the type, one of the type of memberships where um, you have the guest privileges on the, on the upper tier. So that's obviously something we'll have to take a look at to see if that would have to be limited or eliminated for a period of time. Um, and, you know, similar to what Vicky was talking about, we're, we're also going to look at um, scheduled shutdowns throughout the day for cleaning and, and taking reservations for, for bringing members in, that type of thing. So again, it, it's, as Bill was saying at the beginning, it's just, it's challenging to plan for these things when you don't know what these timeframes are or, you know, what phase in your, in your area, what phase gyms will open in and what those phases will look like until I think we have a little bit more clarity from, from the government side. Yeah. But I think well, definitely I with um, the, um, bringing guests in, things like that are going to have to be somewhat limited. Yeah. What platform are you using uh, digitally to schedule people coming and going in? Uh, right now, we're still we're still looking at a number of different platforms. OK, uh, Vicki, I know you're going down that road as well. Are you do you have a platform that you might recommend to the audience? Uh, that's what they're asking is kind of what technology are you using? We're um, we're looking into MindBody. We currently use them in addition to our current operating software. So we're looking at how MindBody works. Um, we're looking into stickers. We're looking into the um, cleaning supplies that Blair mentioned. Um, and this is another part of the whole reopening. As you look at journeying, we don't. You want to look at your employee journey as well. What is it going to be like when someone shows up to work? How are you, is there, are they going to have to check in? What steps are, are going to be needed? So that, that's a huge part of this. I know we're all member focused because they, you know, they're right. important as well. But we got to take care of our team, make sure our team feels comfortable and have systems in place for that to be um, simple and make sure they feel confident in our ability as well. Right, uh, great. Right. great point for sure. And Bill, I know you, you're you really uh, knowledgeable about the technology piece. What, what are you using well, with your clubs? We, in most of our sites, we're a MindBody uh, organization. If we control the site, we use MindBody for not only scheduling, but for our member management system. Uh -huh. So we use it for billing and everything, and, and we have some complex um, multi-purpose sites, and, and, and we're, we're, we're very happy with it. Um, just to go back to, to Vicki's point about the employees and, and the journey mapping that Blair was talking about, um, we're going to do temperatures um, when people come in with the digital thermometers. So that sounds great, but where do you do them? Um, so one idea was we'll do them at the front desk. And, and so, okay, so somebody has a temperature, how do you tell them they have a temperature without embarrassing them in front of the other people and causing chaos with the other people? So you can't do temperatures at the front desk. You gotta have a separate temperature station that's semi-private because you can't tell somebody, you know, and then if they have a temperature, you gotta let them sit down for a few minutes, you're gonna check it again, you know, but, but every one of these little things that we're talking about, has a process map to it, you know, yeah, and a training map. You know, we're going to give everybody, all the employees, their own sanitation bottles. Okay, what does that look like? How do they not get mixed up with others? How are you going to label them? Where are they going to store them? Are they taking them home or leaving them at the club? You know, so every one of these little things has a whole series. So, you know, um, it's okay to make lists, but every one of those lists has to have a whole plan behind it. Yeah, so to that point, Bill, if you're uh, taking people's temperatures, which I know a lot of clubs have ordered the thermometers to do that, uh, not for staff, to your point, Vicki, and also for members, uh, what is the cut point of where you would not allow somebody to come into the club? What 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 temperature reading would that be? I think it's 100.4. Right. Um, does that sound correct? It does. Yep. Yeah. I've heard of several out there, but several of the clubs that I work with that are hospital-based, they're saying they're using 100.4. We, uh, we're, we're affiliated with Providence St. Joseph Healthcare, one of the largest healthcare systems in the country. So yeah. I reached out to them um, for their cleaning protocols on exam rooms, on waiting rooms, because um, you know hospitals have been dealing with this sick people in their space and leaving, and other people coming in with healthy people. You know they've been dealing with that forever. Um, sure. So if you have a relationship with your local hospital, having them look to Blair's point, maybe they're not a epidemiologist but but somebody in that hospital system is responsible for infectious disease control um, so you know use your local resources um, to uh, to see the flow charts and the simplification that the hospital systems and the medical community uses you know, yeah, so, you know that's a that's a unique opportunity and a relationship that you have are there any specific 
things that you've learned through that relationship that you could share with people of something to do or not to do? Um, through that relationship and documents with other people that have read documents and had conversations with me, some things have come out that we don't think about. Um, one of those things is sometimes our people aren't using the chemicals correctly. They're pouring disinfectant in a bucket, they're wiping it down over and over, they're not letting um, a certain disinfectant air dry for 30 seconds or 60 seconds or whatever. So a lot of our teams aren't even using our current products potentially right. uh, as designed for infectious control reasons. So, you know, there's cleaning, there's sanitizing, and there's disinfecting, um, you know, and different stages along that continuum. So, you know, one of the things is making sure that you're using your products the right way on the right surfaces. Um, you know, Blair's got unbelievable resources on, on what's out there product-wise. Um, you know, some of the manufacturers haven't tested some of those things against their products for rust. You know, what can you use on, on iron plates and not have rust develop? You know, what can you use near electronics? You know, so, so the electrostatic stuff, Blair's got a lot of resource on that. I won't try to pretend to know something I don't about that. Um, but knowing your products and what to, how to use them and what for. Right. Okay. And you know, on that point, Bill, that's a great point because you think about our equipment manufacturers, they are all having this conversation right now about warranties. Like, what does that mean to your warranty? And, and you know, that's probably a place that we're going to see a lot of innovation, I think, is from the equipment companies. You know, one of the things I thought of when I saw that nanoseptic is, I don't know, could that be licensed and put into paint, you know, <laughs> or, you know, is there... You know, what are some of the innovations? But that's something, Bill, that, that I know the our equipment companies are really, uh, really concerned about. I want to make a point about what I love what's happening here is the, the attention to the minutia and the detail, and it matters. You know, I mean, like Bill's talking about microprocess. Everybody's talking about the, you know, the small pieces of this, and that's, how, that's the only way that you're going to actually execute. You, you, you started this by asking about, what we're doing to reopen. I have a little bit of concern that I'm gonna spend a bunch of time and money figuring out how to stage people coming in and how I'm gonna do these dues, you know, and it's all for a two week period. You know, I, I don't know if that's a great idea. Uh, so I'm spending a lot more time on the stuff that I know has to last a long time and see if we can do a light lift around those first two weeks or, or first month. Yeah, before we continue on that topic, just, uh another attendee kind of broke in and said that some of the hospitals in their area are suggesting that number needs to be lowered to 99.5 or 99.6. Um, so I don't, I guess there's not a real standard out there nationwide probably is like a lot of things right now, specific to where you are from a geographical standpoint. Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, I think what we're looking at is I'm pretty sure we went to the CDC um, stuff. I mean, because it's, it should be the same protocols that they're using at airports. You know, yeah. I flew to yeah. Moscow and, and they checked my temperature before I got off the plane during the bird flu um, deal. You know, so there should be a set um, federal CDC infectious control recommendation on that. But it's optics. The thermometers are optics to some degree. That's right. That's 70 right. percent of people that have the virus have no symptoms. So what are you going to? You might catch three out of ten, right? So, um, so we're talking about this is optics and this is one little piece that may help with people that are already showing symptoms, but it's not a total solution. Yeah. So, so we were so it, having this it, conversation the, the other day. I know Blair, you and I were having this conversation a little bit about just said part of it is perception. Yes, because a lot, you know, our practical minds as operators and, it, and it's money, right? I mean, we have to spend money here. So our practical minds say, well, you know, if I'm doing this and that, is this really necessary? And right, everything is a signal. Right now, everything is signaling. I don't know if people are going to use the, the foot poles on the doors and the forearm poles on the doors and the nanoseptic. And we're going to have air fix in our, in our, you know, in our clubs. Um, but I think you're way better off with overkill because right now, everything is a signal to the member. And I think Bill's dead on. It's, you know, you're signaling that you're, the, there's a lot of noise in that, in that feedback about are you following expert practices, expert guidance? And if you're not, by the way, those likelihood to return to the gym scores are much lower if, you're, if your expert guidance scores are low. 
Right, right. So, um, and, and Blair, not to keep you on the hook with, with much of these questions, but I know that is a question that a lot of clubs have sent out as part of the MXM survey, is their likelihood to return to the club? And a lot of the clubs have been modeling and uh, setting expectations about what percentage of their members may come back in the first 30 days after opening. And what I'm seeing out there is that's probably around 60, 70%. Do you have any further clarification based on additional data you've gotten over the last week? Yeah, when we look across all the clubs that are there right now, the number that are giving a nine or 10, highly likely to come back in to exercise right after reopening, is about 60%. When you pull in the sevens and eights, uh -huh. then you know highly likely and pretty likely, when you pull in the sevens and eights, it moves up to about 80%. Um, but you need to know that, like if you have multiple locations and, and you look and you see, you know, um, you know, you have 90% nines and tens in a location and you have 60% nines and tens in another location, there's an issue, you know, and, and you need to, you need to figure out why there's a Delta there. And, um, so yeah, well, there may be an issue. Yeah. There may not be right. You could have a higher population of seniors with other conditions at another location. Exactly. So, but, but the issue would be that you, that you're probably not going to ramp your revenue up like you think you are because the seniors are saying they're they're probably not giving zeros to threes right but they're probably fours fives and sixes if they're seniors so so but you're absolutely right bill there might not be any issue at all around you know your ability to clean and sanitize it might just be that that club has more at risk population but you would need to know that and yeah yep yeah so let's uh, let's move off of this sort of the cleaning and the protocols related to the virus and having had the opportunity to reset and again looking toward the reopening from Vicky and Ed especially what are you doing differently when you reopen as far as what you're offering and services or how you might be pricing something? Go ahead, Vicky. I'll let you start. Sure. So we're gonna um, continue to leverage our virtual studio. Um, as a right now we're charging $9.99 bi-weekly and looking at that as an option for those who either um, aren't able to aren't comfortable to accessing our club people that want to go on freeze but giving them a way to stay connected to to the facility so we're continuing looking at how we can continue to leverage the virtual programs that we're offering um, knowing that people might not either feel comfortable or will be restricted in capacity yeah, so Vicki, um, I know you've done a lot of these virtual online classes and so forth. Is there any sort of two or three keys you think to make those really well attended? Is it all about the, the instructor still or are there other factors that are really driving members to, to view it and participate? I think you, utilizing your, your team of instructors that your members and the community know and have a relationship with or feel like they have a relationship with is important. I know that I've heard other discussions in the industry that people are, feel the same way. Um, we've learned that there's a definite education curve for our team with the technology. So the sound, sound quality, logging on if you're doing Facebook Live, Instagram Live, we, use some, we do some stuff through Vimeo as well. So there is that learning curve that is just a, a unanticipated time needed to, to teach the instructors. I mean, we, we even created like dummy sites, dummy Facebook Live sites or, or mock Facebook Live sites to test everything before you go live. Because once you're live, I mean, showtime. Right. So people don't always anticipate the um, learning curve that is there when you're launching into that virtual world. Okay. All right. Oh, Ed, what about you? Yeah, so similar to Vicky, we'll we'll definitely dive into the virtual side. We didn't want to just launch it now, kind of with a gun to our head, because we, we just weren't going to do it well. So we we have some extra space in one location that we're actually working on building out an actual studio to do this exclusively in there, so that it's um, you know almost looking at like you know what Beachbody has, where it's it's, it's everything will be shot in that space, and we kind of look at that as obviously what's what we're going through right now is, is terrible but if we can take something good out of it and you know down the road have an actual virtual studio and uh, a membership add-on from that um, that's something that we're we're definitely working on right now we're pretty excited about another thing that we're doing um, just in the interim though is we all know operating clubs it's it's near impossible to to renovate a locker room while you're opening so we're, we're going through right now and just 
going crazy with the locker rooms, you know, tearing out the old tile, retiling all new surfaces. So we, we really are trying to, to have the members see, and you know, we're posting that on Facebook, have the members see that we're taking this time to, to really make the clubs better so they have something ex exciting to come back to. And again, hopefully this, nothing like this ever happens again, but you know, when do you actually have the time to, to, to shut down your locker rooms and just, you know, tear them apart and, and redo them. So um, we're, we're kind of excited about what this will look like on the other side for the member. Okay. Yeah, to that point, and it uh, connects maybe in answering another attendee's question, which are any of you kind of repurposing any of the spaces that you're currently or you're not anticipating using upon opening, like perhaps childcare area or a lounge area or a food and beverage area? Are you sort of kind of cannibalizing that and creating a, an additional workout spaces to get some distancing? Have y'all tried any of that or looked into that? Anyone? Yeah, we have, we have a basketball court in one of our locations, so we're looking at repurposing that for fitness space, looking into potentially creating personal training pods, so there's designated areas for our trainers to work with with their clients. And um, as we know, the anticipate space limitations in classes, kind of shifting from the traditional team training of 20 to 30 people in a class, because you probably won't be allowed to do that, to more of the um, small group training of four to six people at a time working with the trainer. Yeah. So have the all to that point as well, have you taken the step to sort of lay out, are you taking the approach of we're going to kind of put marks in our studios as far as the distancing that's going to be required and as far as people checking at the front desk and, uh, you know, turning off every other piece of cardio equipment. Are you doing some things like that or are you really th thinking the members are going to know and understand what physical distancing is supposed to be and you're sort of going to let them manage that themselves what's your thoughts on that i think we have to um give it given the members a guideline so we're looking into stickers as soon as they start walking in the building check-in desk stickers on the floor we're going to have special signage on the equipment to, to signify the equipment that's closed down potentially i don't know if we're going to put stickers on them or not um but yeah we're definitely going to mark, have designated space signage i do a lot of I, telling the group earlier, I like to go out to a, a public uh, business at least one time a day for my sanity, but it gives me an opportunity to do market research so I can see how the businesses that are open are handling their customers with the stickers and the, and the, uh, the signage and the plexiglass. So we're gonna incorporate a lot of things we see in grocery stores and, and other businesses that are open currently. Okay, good. Yeah, I think uh, we have to take our cue from the grocery stores because if you go out now, like Vicky's saying, you're seeing tape and you know, telling people where to stand and where not to stand and where to wait. I think, I think we definitely have to to take that cue. I, I we think there's two. I think, oh, go ahead, Bill. I mean, we've just developed a signage package, and I think the more professional, or at least not police tape and blue tape and masking tape. You know, you know, if you show that you thought through this and you have decals, floor vinyls, wall vinyls signage you know that again is optics that shows man they've been thinking about this they've mapped this journey out for me and 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 so um i would suggest you really get your graphics package down on that the other thing that somebody um a friend of mine told me yesterday was i didn't even think about tracks indoor tracks you know taking making the middle lane unusable or signage that says please don't use the middle lane and then the spatial distancing on the tracks you know Again, you know, every one of these spaces has got to be thought through from that member's perspective. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Blair. I, I, I think you want to think of your spaces in two different ways. What are the spaces that people are traveling through versus the spaces where people are fixed? And when you go out and you go to a supermarket, they're dealing with everything as far as people are constantly moving and traveling through. There's an indoor, there's an outdoor, there's a way to walk up and down the aisles, there's a checkout lane, there's a and so it's constant movement. And I, I don't know, I, 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 other than really having the signaling, um, if you have a room that normally has 40 in their body pump and you only have enough tools for 20 and you limit it to 20, people are not going to pack that room. I mean, people, are, people will space out on their own. I do think there's those places where people are going to be in a fixed spot that, you, that, the, you know, that, that the layout might not be as necessary. You see right now, I mean, all of your members in all of your classes 
self-adjust their space right now when it's too crowded. And so I, I think it's important to kind of think about the spaces in those two ways. Where are people moving? Because, you know, right now, if we're if we're scheduling people to come in and because we're looking at exactly the same thing that, that, that Vicky's talking about, right? Having that space in between. I, I just don't know if I'm doing it just for a two week period or if I'm doing it for a month yet, right? I, I don't know what that means yet. But you know, are they all at the door at one time? I, I think that I think that pattern at check-in is is almost that pattern at check-in, the patterns going into kids club eventually, phase three, are going to be a bit more critical, I think. Um, where people are moving and tend to sort of be in a hurry. I think I think that might be a bit more critical there. Yeah. So related to access to the club in general or even getting a spot, you know, in the classroom for a studio type class, how are you going to effectively manage that? Is it sort of a first come, first serve or you're going to put it out digitally and let them sign up? How are you all seeing that actually play out in real time? We're starting with all classes being scheduled and reserved online or you could theoretically do it at the club, but it's on the mind body scheduler. Okay. Anybody else doing something differently? Okay. So my next question is, uh, we've talked about the fact that we're going to be offering limited services and the class sizes are going to be a little lower. Most clubs probably are not going to be opening the, or providing access to their locker rooms initially or the wet areas or perhaps the swimming pools. So when you do reopen, what are your thoughts and what are your strategies? I'd like to hear from each of you about the dues you're gonna be charging when you do open your doors. Are you gonna be charging full dues just like when you closed? Are you offering a discounted rate? Are you giving a, a month free right up front, which is what some clubs are doing? What is your plan as far as how you're charging uh, and how you're gonna launch that? We'll start with Ed and then we'll go around. Go ahead, Ed. So when we reopen, um, we are, we're a lower price point club anyhow, so we, we plan on charging regular dues, but we're going to be incredibly flexible with people. We know there's going to be a lot of hesitation to come back in. Um, and ju just like when we closed, you know, as, as far as freezes, cancels, anything, we, we just want to at this, especially now more than ever, but at all, at all times, just say yes. I mean, I think the worst thing we could have right now is some kind of argument over freezing or billing or anything like that. So obviously we're not charging members now, but even when we reopen, um, we'll be communicating with what we've done, what we're doing, what our expectations are for them. But at the same time, we know whatever percentage of those members that number ends up being, there's gonna be a lot of people that are gonna be hesitant to come back. And we'd, we'd much rather keep them on freeze than just have them cancel on us. So um, our, our thoughts are to, to charge our regular rates, but be incredibly, incredibly flexible. So to that point, Ed, if you allow the member to go on freeze, is that a complimentary freeze? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, or is there yeah there'll be no charge for that. Um, and again, be, and I, I can't say what the date will be, but for the for the coming future, it's going to be, you know, we're going to work with it case by case. So if somebody says, I want to be frozen for six months, you know, we're going to do it because I don't think when we reopen, the word no is going to be something that we, we really want to be saying to people because it's just going to be such a crazy time for everybody. Yeah, I think that's a great point not to be overlooked, right? We all want to, in times like these, we want to default to yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, first. <laughs> okay. Unless it's, I want to come in too. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. Bill, what about active? What I know you got a bunch of different properties, but what yeah, sort I mean, of summary? We, 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 in general, we are thinking that we're going to open our locker rooms and, and showers. Um, saunas, steam rooms, pools, whirlpools won't be open. But, um, but you know, my thought process right now is in the corporate environment, showers are necessary. Also, somebody might want to clean off all this health club stuff before they go home. So showers may be part of the messaging that it's a good idea, not a bad idea. So our, our current point is... Um, is showers open, but nothing else. Um, we're not gonna have towels, we're not gonna have childcare, we're gonna have reservations only on group fitness and small group training. Um, but uh, we are gonna charge regular dues. We are doing exactly what Ed's doing. We're saying yes when we can. We normally have a hold fee. Right now we have a zero hold fee. Um, we uh, value add is, is we're gonna continue the digital program suite that we created for free for members for some period of time, if not, part of their membership, we're working through that. Um, but that's kind of our general playbook right now. 
Okay, Vicki? Yeah, similar to, to Bill and Ed, we plan on charging full dues, utilizing our virtual and digital um, programs as, um, as an option for people who want to freeze but still stay connected to the club. Um, for those people who just want to freeze and don't really want to have much interaction with us, we let them freeze for, for free, but we want to make it as frictionless and, and seamless for our members as possible because they're, they're going to remember how they're treated during this time. They're going to remember what happened when we, we found out we had to close, how, you, how our clubs treated them, and they're going to remember how we're treating them now as we're reopening. Um, so we're taking that into account and want to make it as simple as possible for them. Okay, so before we have you answer, Blair, uh, just a couple of questions. There's a bunch of them actually popping up. You know, how are clubs deciding whether, like to your point, Bill, you're opening the locker rooms. Some people are saying, well, why wouldn't you open your pools? Why not the wet areas? Why why are you not providing towels? So where where are we getting, where are you getting those insights to make those decisions, I guess? Uh, mine are talking to other people and judgment calls, thinking through how I would react. Um, uh -huh. You know, so the towels may or may not be the be all end all. Um, you know, having a reused towel handled by multiple people stored in different areas, given to a member and put on a member's face and body, to me just sounds like not an ideal circumstance. Um, right. And really would love to get out of the towel business in some of my locations. Um, right. So I'm hoping that that can continue actually. Yeah, um, I was gonna ask if you were brave enough to make that a permanent decision. I might in certain locations. Um, and then the aquatics piece is, you know, I don't know enough about how it's transmitted in water, um, you know, the humidity factor within the pool environment, um, sitting next to somebody in a spa, you know. So so for the phase one, we just figured no wet products, no sauna, um, no towels. Uh, we'll have towels probably, you know, either bagged or um, or obviously very, very clean and bright um, for people that, that didn't get the message before we, they came in. Um, but, um, but basically I'm thinking through um, how I would react and how other people would react in conversation is coming up with what I think would be the best play for that particular location. Okay, okay, back to you, Blair. Full dues, no dues, what, what, are, you, what are you gonna do? Don't know yet. I mean, we're looking at a couple of things. Um, you know, if it, if it's really going to be limited um, for a month or so, you know, I'm 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 wondering, and and also I think it's really important. Whatever your strategy is, make sure you're talking to your member management software company in advance to find out if they can actually execute your strategy. Because something I've heard some pr really complex ones. You know, we're going to turn dues on when somebody checks in. Check check and see if they can actually do that. I mean, because they're they're those those poor companies are freaking handling so, a mess too. Right. I mean, this is something that they never expected to have to go through. So I think it's really important that you talk to your member management software companies. We're floating out different ideas. Um, we're floating out um, if it's going to be limited. Maybe we have people pay, buy a spot in the gym and pay cash up front for it for 30 days. In other words, let's say it was going to be limited to 250 per club. I'm throwing arbitrary numbers out here. Maybe what we do is we open that up and say, we're not turning anybody's dues on yet, but for these first 500 spots, it'll be $100 for the next month. Or, and I, again, I'm just throwing out some numbers out here, but there's gonna be high demand for a few spots, and I'm not sure how to manage that yet. Um, the scheduling can work, but it just depends on what they're going to tell us that we can do as, health, as a health club. So I'm looking at multiple strategies. The other one would be the opposite end of the spectrum, right? Like there's only going to be about 50% of the people that can use the club. That maybe what we do is we charge it's it's free, you know, until 30 days in, and then all dues come on. We're right. so we're kind of balancing those those two strategies. It does have me think sort of strategically in a more in a more broad sense. I know that both uh, Baird Investment Bank, Piper, and some of the other analysts out there are predicting 30% contraction in the industry in some markets. And some of those are from some really big players. Right. I do think this is sort of an opportunity for the independent club owners because a lot of the big, a lot of the big guys had to just, you know, throw the breakers and, and, and walk out of the clubs. And they may not be in working on all the processes that, Ed, that Ed's working on, all of the plant and equipment stuff that Vicky's working on and process stuff. And they're probably not in their clubs doing that. They're probably working at a very high level on, on cleaning and sanitizing, creating manuals, things like that. So I do think it's a real opportunity there. 
But if there's 30% contraction um, and you can't have as many people in your club, where does that demand go, right? I mean, so, um, and let's say you're the best product in your market and, and you're sort of thinking, well, wow, that's gonna be a lot of demand for me. But do people wanna be that packed in? I, I, and I don't, I don't have any answers to this, but I do think that people are, are gonna start innovating some different business models and the digital platforms are probably gonna absorb some of that. But I, I'll keep saying this, I'll remind everybody, you know, digital poker was out there and it became very popular, digital poker, became, and, and that's what filled every poker room in America after a year, right? Yeah. I, I think there's some opportunity for the industry. I don't know where the extra capacity goes when gyms can't have as many people in them. That's an opportunity somehow. Yeah, speaking of your idea of, you know, related to the cash, members just kind of paying cash and buying their opportunity to visit. Some clubs are going cashless as another touch point they're going to eliminate. Uh, so they don't have to exchange the money and the touching and handling of cash. Another opportunity perhaps to change your model, yeah. at least a slight variation. So we're almost out of time. And before I let everybody kind of have a closing comment, I just want to thank all the attendees. Again, I'm trying to incorporate the questions. My guess is we probably had 60 questions roll in on the chat box, which we just can't answer them all. Uh, so I tried to keep up with them and uh, weave them into the conversation. Apologies if we didn't get uh, your exact question answered. So uh, as we close it out today, uh, Ed, uh, I mean, Vicki, I'll let you start. And Ed, you can go next. Uh, is there any kind of closing comment you just share, either an idea, uh, or recommendation as you prepare for opening or something you might sure. like to speak to here? Right now we're talking about opening, but I think as an owner operator, it's important to think like what's gonna be the financial implications of this six months, 12 months, 18 months, you know, 24 months down the road. So that's important to keep in mind. And then one thing that's not really being talked about much is just the impact that this closure is gonna have in society on everyone's mental health, our mental health, our employees' mental health, society's mental health. And the encouraging thing is, as we all know, fitness has the ability to improve your mental state and decrease stress. So I think there's huge opportunity for us as an industry to be included in part of that conversation because right now we're all feeling kind of good, even though we're in SOB, save our business mode. We're feeling kind of good because there's hope and talk of reopening. This depression and mental impacts could, could be something that's hitting us six months, 12 months down the road. So I think it's something we need to plan for. I think there's opportunity in our industry and it gives us the ability to do more good in the world and change more lives. So that's my mic drop. Yeah, I think that's awesome. That's excellent. Okay, Ed? I think going off of what Vicki and Blair both were, were saying is I think you know we're all in a bit of a panic mode right now but we also do have to keep our eyes open for the opportunities whether they be you know future investment partnerships um you know new locations whatever it may be because you know through through the history of time when when bad things happen good things do come out of them and the, the people that are just kind of in a hole panicking right now they're not going to come out of it but if, if you look at this as an opportunity and say you know when the chips are down that's that's when great companies are built um, I think if you have that mindset, you know, whether it be, you know, stoic philosophy or whatever, if you come out of it looking like that, th there, there are going to be opportunities on the other side, whether it's, it's through contraction or whatever it may be. Um, the, the first week that this happened, my wife kind of said something that, that stuck with me. She said, we're going through an unbelievable time right now. And, and people in this time may agree to things even that they normally wouldn't and that can create future opportunities. So just being, keeping your eyes open and kind of keeping your head on a swivel during this time um, while you're doing the things you need to do, um, there, there, there are opportunities and somebody will find them. Yeah, yeah, good, good words, Ed, thank you. Blair? So a, co a couple of, by, by the way, Ed, it's really good that what your wife said to you wasn't get the hell out of the house, right? <laughs> well, that was a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> um, uh, two things. I I, I really oh, plan for a very slow ramp. If it's faster, that's awesome. But man, please plan for that very slow ramp. I think that's exactly what Vicky saying about how they're planning. The other thing, and, and no one will be surprised that I'm going here. If you're not getting voice of customer, it, that voice of customer becomes as critical as running water in your in your clubs after this. There are new eyes that's a different, it's a different mindset coming back into these clubs. And you're doing things 
right now during the shutdown and you're making assumptions, we're all making assumptions, some of us on more data than others, but we're making assumptions about what the world's gonna look like. The people that will tell you if you got it right are your members and they will tell you every day. And, and you have to have that data. I just, coming out of the financial crisis, that's what we saw from the companies that had existential threats. They knew that we have to, we have to understand how we're perceived in the customer's eyes forevermore. And so that would be my two plan for a slow ramp. You better have a great operational member management, member experience management system. I don't know who you'd get it from, but you would. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay, Bill. Yeah, and I would, I would just to build on Blair, um, the, uh, the shutdown survey is amazing. Listen, listen, listen to your customers. Um, and don't be, don't be defensive. Like you're going right. to have somebody come in and say, oh, why didn't you think of that? And you're going to go, because, da, 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 or you're going to go, man, I don't know. Go, oh, man, I don't know. That's a great idea. So uh, you're going to miss stuff. Um, there is no perfection here. None of us know how to do this, you know, um, completely. So you're going to miss stuff. Don't be defensive when your members call you out on it. Listen, 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 you know, get the feedback. And then you got to control the narrative on your cleanliness, hygiene, staff processes, employee culture, because the press is starting to pound on us. I've seen the last two things of Health Club mentions on C CNN and, and, and CNBC have been, you know, how could, how could Health Clubs be in the first phase with all those germs and sweat and close proximity and people close to each other? So, you know, when you have a chance to control the narrative with your members and your community about what you're doing, um, take advantage of that because the press is. The press is hitting on the germ aspects of our industry. Um, we don't, we're gonna miss stuff. Um, do your best, we'll get through it. Yeah. Um, great point. Yeah. Thanks. yeah, great points, Bill, I appreciate that. So three things in closing. Number one, all of the panelists that we've had for the last four weeks, including today's panel, are all Rex Roundtable members. If you're interested in that, uh, opportunity to reach out to me uh, directly if you'd like to do that. Next, we also have a webinar next week. Uh, we'll have Blair and Bill and myself back. We'll have two additional guests, and we're going to talk more about preparing for reopening. Uh, it'll be much closer. We're all keeping our fingers crossed for all of us uh, at uh, next week's webinar time slot. Uh, and then finally, just remember you're the salt and the light wherever you are. We'll see everybody next week. Thanks for joining in. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Ted, Vicki, Thank Blair, Brent. All the best. Bye. Thanks.